afternoon. I'm very happy to see all of you here, the courageous ones for the last slot of the day. Yeeha, hope you have a great day. Today we're going to talk about the new platform and the language called Eve. And we're going to look at that. We're going to look at the, some design decisions that they made to make the language interesting. And the second half of the talk, we're going to look at which tools in the Java ecosystem could have been inspired by Eve. So uh, it's, a, it's a new experimental platform, and people doing that are just running experiments about how to maybe better write software. So it's not directly applicable, but it is typically inspiring. And I hope you will look into that and think about, well, maybe, maybe something like this would be useful in my applications. And then when you develop software, you will think about how to make it possible. Let's start about with me. Uh, I'm a developer advocate. Uh, my name is Alex Shalaev. I come from uh, the company called Zero Turnaround. And usually I reside in Estonia, which is kind of terribly cold right now. Uh, and so I'm happy to be here. As developer advocate, one of my main responsibilities is to care about the community. So I like uh, talking to all kinds of developers. I've been a developer for approximately eight years before switching to this different role. I'm one of the co-leader of a virtual jug. Uh, and you can find me on Twitter if you have any questions uh, about this session, software development, or life in general. Zero Turnaround is a company that does tools for Java developers. Uh, we have a booth at the expo floor. So if you're going to come and talk to us and check those out, we would be happy, and my employer will be happy, and they will send me to more places to talk to more awesome people. With all that mandatory thing out of the way, let's talk about software development. And if you talk about software development, you know that it's typically pretty complex and hard task, and it's a demanding job. And while I know that we typically enjoy developing software, otherwise, well, we wouldn't be developers it really is kind of complicated. And there are a number of reasons for that, uh, one of which is the software that we develop is uh, there are large, complex systems c consisting of many moving parts. And this is, the, the I think, the first image that you see in Google when you Google software architecture or web application architecture. And you can see there are many, many layers. So the thing is, most applications, uh, what they just do, they transform data. Right? We, it, we have a database store somewhere, and that database store contains data, and the user request comes. We take some data out of that, transform that into the user credentials, and so on, pass it through the layers of our system, and then uh, pass the data back, transforming that at every layer. The complication from that comes that every layer takes different approaches to how to handle and represent the data, and through, they try to hide some abstractions, try to hide some corner cases. But the offering you an abstraction for this particular layer, they also introduce vocabulary. They int introduce some corner cases and in different data models. So there are HTTP verbs, there are SQL queries, and there are no SQL solution. So if you put everything into like a, like a table, right, you will see that typically, there will be a data model. There will be read operations to get the values from the data model. There will be write operations. And you can see that through the typical layers in the web applications, though those abstractions and those data models will be different. And from that comes a lot of complexity. Naturally, as accomplished developers, we learned how to tackle that. Right? We, we live and breathe this day in, day out. So it comes to us as a second nature. But typically, if you think about how did you start when you started development, or how would different new people come into the industry, they will be pretty confused about that. And on every layer, like even if we don't look at the picture in, 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 in general, there will be two ways to look at, at the operations, what's possible. So one will be a very high level abstraction. If we talk about HTTP or how the internet works, you could imagine that it works magically like that, and you have some user story, and there is a uh, magic thing that 
satisfies the request by the user. And this will be high-level abstraction. They're easy to understand. They're not very useful because they limit applicability of that. There are many languages and programming languages. They typically occupy some certain niches in software development. And say the easiest way with the highest level of abstraction will be DSL, a specific language to co cover specific business needs. But typically, they will have very little applicability. If you think about something that almost any person can do, think about the spreadsheet. Right? You can create formulas in there. You can perform some computation in the spreadsheet. But there is very little what you can do with the spreadsheet, especially if you consider normal tasks of a software development. It's really hard to create a web application inside a, an Excel spreadsheet. Or there are hard to do real-time apps or distributed systems. Kind of impossible. So you need to go deeper. And when you go deeper, you uncover that there are very, very many details of what happens even when you do the simplest action. So as an example of that, the same user story of bringing Google.com to the web page, there is a repository with quite a lot of text that explains what exactly is happening at every stage of processing that request. There is everything from what happens when your key is pressed, how the operating system interacts that. And this is not an abstraction. right? This is an sp explicit specification of what happens. You can do anything with that. You can modify that to your needs, but it's really complex. I don't believe that any normal software developers actually even understand how the computers work to this level. So we all deal with some sort of abstractions. But as we know, they are all leaky. And we know that at least since 2002, very long time ago. And, and that's, wh that's why the software development complex. So enter Chris Granger. Uh, He's an exceptional person and a very smart guy. And uh, he's one of the main people behind the platform EVE, about which we're going to talk in a minute. Somewhere in 2011, I think, maybe 12, they wanted to tackle the problem how to make software development easier, not just for new people, but for developers as well. So what they first thought, they thought that we don't have enough tools. And if we have better tools, we're going to have better experience development software. Maybe tooling can help. So naturally, they picked the first tool that any developer uses throughout the day, and that was the IDE. And they decided, let's build a new IDE. And the main point of the light table, which is now has become an open source project, is and it's a fairly interesting IDE. What they wanted to do, they wanted instant feedback to the changes they do, do to the code. And they wanted to bring the source code that you write and the execution of the code that you see in an application closer together. So one of the defining features of the light table were that they would render the values of uh, variables right next to the source code using small rectangles. So you execute the code, and then propagate the, that data back into your source code. And at that time, that was pretty interesting. Uh, now I know that IntelliJ IDEA at least does that, I think, out of the box. I don't know about other IDs, but at some point they decided that, yeah, ID is great, but it doesn't solve actually problems. Because while it is a tool, it's still it, programming involves loads of abstractions. And, and they are hard to learn, and they're hard to operate with. So they decided to pivot into a different project, and they created or started created EVE. EVE is a, uh, a, program, uh, a programming language and a platform with the main goal to give anyone access to uh, programming and computing as a general purpose tool. So to avoid that very steep learning curve, but at the same time not to limit the applicability of the programs that we write. So the ceiling on the power is low, and, but the abilities of the platform should be immense. So they should be ready to, do, to create normal, typical, solutions to the programs. So we would have real-time collaboration, sharing data between programs, building web applications. But they wanted it to be understandable. So they created the platform, and they created a language. And the language uh, and the programs in that language in Eve look like this. Eve operates on blocks of code. So it uses literate programming, 
and you, you specify your program in a file using pieces of text like that so that your IDE is anything that can handle a markdown file. Every block of code concerts, consists of a couple of operations. Uh, Eve views and looks at the world and tries to see everywhere a database. A database not in a typical relational database uh, meaning, but a storage for the records, which is the main uh, thing that Eve operates at. So the block looks like that. You search a database, you pattern match the records that were found in the database, you transform the data using some uh, operations, and then you bind or persist the data back into the database. And in this case, when I say database, it doesn't have to be like a document store, but everything can be database. Just like GraphQL looks the universe, uh, at the universe like a graph, and there is some wrapper that actually hides the complexity of the world and makes it look like it's a graph, the same way Eve looks at the world and sees only records. And uh, apparently, the, typically people know two models of computation. So we know Turing machines, obviously, whereas you have a, uh, a tape with cell values where you can read and write data. Or there is the lambda calculus, which is equivalent, where you have functions and application of those functions. You also have a, the third kind of obscure model where you have a string of data, and then your operations are you take a substring of that uh, based on the pattern match, and you change values, and you write it back into the same string, and you apply that operation again and again. And allegedly, that model of computation is equally powerful to the first two. So it can do anything that normal program can do. And it is kind of what happens with Eve as well. There is documents, you find stuff, you modify stuff, and you put it back into the database. Database could be anything. The communication channel between your server and your client could be a database, and you can write records to that. Your HTML uh, view of your application, it consists of records, which are the tags. You can write, modify them, you can write them back. It could be a communication between distributed parts of your system. It could be the actual persistent store or anything. The records is what Eve operates at, and this is a dominant data structure in Eve, and it looks like that. You define a record, you give it a name, and you give it a sequence of tags, which would be the qualities, the parameters on which would you like to pattern match. Remember, you don't just create records out of the blue. Typically, you would find them from a certain database, and you wouldn't like all the records in that database, but you can specify the constraints. Records can be nested, and you can have more complex parameters, and you can, you can, you can have a couple of syntax options to, to specify them. So you can uh, use uh, attributes through the documentation. Not, notice that this equality is there. It is not an assignment. This is the equivalent side, so you don't just modify it yet. You can also have nested records, and you if, since every record has to have a tag, which is kind of like a class, to specify what kind of objects we are trying to deal with, you can omit the tag, and you can use just the hashtag thing. So all those three uh, lines would pattern match the records of type person, where one will specify the age and empty address, another one will specify the age as well, or just the find people by name, which is Ryan. So those two things are equivalent. And records is how Eve does the pattern matching. And after that, you, you can deal with this, those values. If you want to talk about operations, there are a very limited set of actions that you can perform. The first one is search. And that's, as I said, the pattern matching of the record in a database. You can also commit, which is the way to tell Eve to persist a data record into the database. Or you can have search and bind. And in the bind system, you, you specify a database to persist data into, and you specify the records that you would like to persist. You can use information from pattern match records. And bind is a very special operation. It tells Eve to update all the subsequent records that support this change. So if in this case we search for the time, Every time the time will change, this code block will be executed. 
then we'll get the number of hours, and then we will bind into the database, which is a browser, a div that uses the information from that. That means that whatever else is dependent on, on the record that we created in the HTML, the, those code blocks will be executed when the value of time will change. So this way, you can think of this as the big Excel spreadsheet where you specify values and we specify dependencies between the cells. But you don't do that in the weird format of a spreadsheet, but you specify that declaratively uh, in, a, in a text file. And that is, uh, that is how Eve programs look like. We're going to look at a more complex example of that in a couple of minutes. So think about this. You can have multiple uh, records. Uh, you don't have the assignment. This is equivalence. That this is the pure example of a logical programming, which is uh, as well as functional programming or object-oriented programming is a paradigm about how to structure and execute the programs. The cool thing about this and the very interesting bit and why you could be inspired by Eve uh, is that for object-oriented programming, we know which types of problems it solves well. For functional programming, we also know a class of programs which it solves well. For example, when you need to process a stream of data, functional programming is a natural answer. If you need to have like a mutate, mutable state, probably functional programming will not be a good answer, but an object-oriented paradigm probably will be. The thing with logical programming is that it's hard to find the niche for which the logical program will be the proper answer uh, onto the question, how, what's the most natural way to, to, to solve that problem? But maybe, maybe Eve can make some steps into what's, what, to give us an answer why logical programming is great. I know one example of a very uh, widely used logical program, and that is the bytecode verifier in the JVM. I think it's still written in Prolog. So if you, if you want to get accustomed with that, you can look into that. This is literally a specification of how the bytecode verifier should look. And it's the big chunk of Prolog code, because that's the easiest way to specify constraints. But other than that, it's a kind of niche thing. Based on the patterns in those records, you can have filters. If you think about databases, typically what you think about is an SQL. right? It works the same way. It's a DSL to access data stored in database. So corresponding to the select will be the search operation. Corresponding to the where clause will be ability to filter attributes. You can filter them directly in the record, so just using the record description syntax. You can filter them out of the record, or you can use also the dot notation to access the attributes and perform uh, filtering on that. Just querying the data typically is not enough. So sometimes you need more complicated ways to describe your data. Eve supports the conditional equivalence. So we can have the if-else blocks when you specify the code. And, and uh, you can provide the parameters or transform them on the fly while you're searching. Eve also has functions. And functions are a very interesting thing. So it's not the function in a typical Java way so where you specify a method and it can do anything. All functions have the same signature, two types of signature. They take a set of records, and they return a set of records. And the functions operate on that set of records element-wise. So they take all the records in the set that were pattern match, and they implement, say, a map operation from the stream API. So you operate on every record one by one, and then you return the output set. Or you can have the aggregates. And aggregate just collapse the set of operation, the set of records into a single value, and that would be corresponding to the fault or reduce in the functional programming. So with those two, you get uh, fairly complex tools that are easy to use given the standard syntax and primitive operations, not primitive, trivial to understand the operations of search and binding, and then you can do complex manipulation. The standard library. The standard library is uh, not very large, but it gives you the essential tools to create web applications. So they have the aggregates, they have the math, syntax, uh, strings. You can have the HTML library for it's a low-level interface to create uh, HTML elements, because we will be focused, uh, focusing on web apps, because that's how we 
develop software now. You have the UI library, which is the syntactical sugar for HTML. So you have a much easier time specifying elements, like UI buttons and columns and everything. But you also have access to files. You have access to system, uh, which typically will provide either randomness or the time. This, the system parameter here is essential because what you want to do, you want your system to react to time passing. And to do that, you need to declare a database and you need to search on the time. And that will be provided from the system library. Or you can just output stuff to the console. But with accessing the file system, what you can do, you can build everything, right? When you have the uh, operating system support for reading and writing files, you can build all kinds of complex programs. Eve comes currently into, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a runtime. Currently, it's 0 0.3 release, and it's written in JavaScript, surprisingly enough. Currently, they're working on 0 0.4, uh, where they will rewrite quite a bit of that in Rust for performance reasons. But uh, they're working on it. So, and you can run that in headless mode. So if you would like to write a simple program with Eve and serve it from somewhere, you're totally fine to do that. You just need node and run the JavaScript. And you will have an, or you can just go and write small programs in an online sandbox. Besides the standard library, you can modify the data directly. So if you have a record, you can commit a different type of record uh, where you will change these things. Uh, you can add attributes to the set of favorite foods with plus equals. So you do not increment that by pizza, but you append that. You can remove elements, or you can fill, uh, merge two records into a complex record. After that, uh, this is everything you can do with the records. And the only other thing that Eve knows how to handle is the database. And this is, this is uh, one of the most important things in Eve. Anything can be a database. If you don't specify a database, you will, you will operate on the local namespace uh, of the records that you just committed. Think about that as a global variable store. But you can have any kinds of records. You can search from one database and bind values into a different database. This is how you would take information from one data, the actual relational data store, and forward that to the client, stuff like that. Eve platform provides you with a number of with a number of uh, implementations for databases, and you can do pretty interesting things. So why I'm talking to you this is just to give a glimpse of what Eve consists of, and now I'm going to go and show you a couple of programs in Eve, and you'll get a taste of that. And then we'll talk about the good parts of that, what people can do using Eve, and should they be, should they be, I'm not advocating for you for using Eve, but I'm advocating probably for thinking about how interesting Eve is. Excellent, you can see my screen. I'm not sure the resolution is uh, what it's supposed to be, but it looks okay. No, might be not. What about this? No, stop. Yeah, this is fine. Excellent. So this is what an if ID looks like. You have the a table of contents. You have a single file, which is a program. It's a literal program, which is a great because you can merge the specification or your intention, what you want to do, and the actual code blocks. And you can see that there are the code blocks right in there where you would specify the code. Let's remove uh, the table of contents. The good thing about this is that you merge your intent for writing program and the program together. If you ever saw an outdated Javadoc file, uh, not Javadoc file, Javadoc comment on the method, this is how you would probably eliminate that problem. It's very hard to change the code without changing text about it when it's like just continuous block of code. And you can see that uh, the blocks of code can get uh, fairly complicated uh, but he recognized the same structure that you have. So we, in this example, for example, we search the browser and the session for the menu. And if we find that, you can uh, see the message click here to begin. This example is a Flappy Bird game. 
and it actually works, and it's all written in Eve, and it renders the HTML right here. A cool thing about that is that they have, the program is just the declarative blocks of code. What makes it work is that the platform takes the data, takes the real world, and pushes that through your program, just like you do in the reactive programming programs. Uh, you specify the code, and you don't specify how to manipulate the data, but you just specify that I would like to do this, this, and that, and some system takes care of providing data and passing it forward to the next chunk of code. This does the same. The benefit, the direct benefit of that, is that platform has immense visibility into your code and what it does. So they have the thing called magic debugger, and it's enabled by clicking that button, and it gives you tools to access and debug your program at the unbelievable layer level. So if I click on the button, if I click on the element that is rendered, first of all, it scrolls down into the view, the code block that actually renders that. It knows what renders any element because, well, that's the system handling the uh, declarative code. You can see the attributes, so it's very easy to debug. You can find the events uh, to which this object will react. But most importantly, wait a second, come back. You can say, oh, you can say why this is drawn, why this is not drawing, and everything. To show you that it's actually this program, let me just change it on the fly. I'll take my Twitter image. I will replace that. And when I click play, you can see that it changed and it's still working. So this is an excellent feat. Uh, but it shows that this actual program works in that. Another cool thing is if you click with the magic debugger on the, any block of code, you can see that it can tell you why this code block was not executed or failed, or how much time did it take in a general performance uh, sense. So you see the data of how much time the system was actually dealing with this particular chunk of code. Again, this is only possible because uh, the system handles the data transfer between blocks of code for you. Why is it cool? Because it's kind of very easy to adapt the systems because it has this very tight coupling between the source code and the actual execution of the program. This is what they probably wanted to do with the IDE when they started that. But unless you control the system and the platform, you cannot have a very tight connection. But it would be very cool to have that. So you can play with Eve just like on the, on the website and they have uh, multiple examples of what to do, including, I think, one of my favorite is the typical to-do MVC thing, quite working. And you can see that it's just, what, 60 lines of actual code. So you can play with that on your free time if you get inspired. I don't think you actually should do that, but you totally can do that if you, if you want to. So let's go and talk about how this is uh, relevant to Java developers and what trade-offs do they have when they decided the system. So the good parts, you have code and comments in the same place, so you will intuitively change the specification first. It allows all the parts of this team work on the same code base in the same way. Another po uh, very positive thing is it views world as the data. So the, your data model and your abstractions are quite simple. What do you want to do? You still, whatever you want to do, you still use the same syntax, so it's very easy to comprehend. At the same time, you can have complex interactions like sending an email or Slack message or uh, changing the HTML uh, in a very intuitive way. I think there are like nine operations in total that Eve supports. Compared to how much Java offers you and how many uh, ways to shoot yourself in the foot using any lower level language, this is pretty sophisticated. The reactive blocks of code are an amazing way to specify and declare what program needs to do. It literally, you say, when I see the pattern, let me execute those things. And Eve will take care of that. And that is very sweet. The transparency and effortless virtual visualization of what is happening inside gives you very nice tools for development. You can also have the monitoring uh, or uh, memory monitoring or performance monitoring right in there. And on top of that, you have this magical debugger 
which can help you develop programs very easily. I, for one, would, I wouldn't miss that in Java, but now I know that it exists. Sometimes it would have be very handy just by clicking somewhere and saying, like, oh, bring me to code that uh, renders this or doesn't render a thing. So those are very good parts, but the biggest benefit of Eve is that they have this single philosophy that the code is not an asset, it's a liability. The more code you have, the harder it is to change, and the more code you have, the more you would be likely to dig into different abstractions and ruin things for other developers to come who will not maybe that well versed in the abstractions that you're using. So job security is fine, but it obfuscates the code. Uh, just like GraphQL, uh, if pretends everything is a database, but what if is great at is that any system that you write, it separates the querying because you have the search operation, it separates the querying of the operations from persisting the operations. And this is something that currently is uh, getting much more uh, popular. So you would like to have the command query responsibility segregation in any of your apps. You would like to have different ways of how you query the data and different model for that and different data model for writing operations. And you would like the data propagate between those two easily. Uh, it's a great system. It's really kind of not that easy to implement in normal Java or other uh, languages, but if takes that and does that with, with ease because they control the full platform. And also, if you think of a one block of code, they can do just several things. They can hold some local state and they can modify the local state. They can react to things in the, in the environment and they can also send messages or say that, oh, you next block of code, please update yourself. So it's very similar to the actor model of writing applications, and if it's very similar to the stateless API handlers. So you read the data from the buffer, manipulate stuff, and then write the response bu bu buffer. So it's a powerful concept, and you, you see the, how those things uh, kind of mirror themselves in Eve. So it is an experiment, but it's a very interesting experiment. So the single vision allows Eve to have declarative programming to have database data like keys and triggers, dependency tracking, debugging, watching expressions, the reloading of the code, the serializable state, performance profiling, and the distributed data and computation all in one package. So those are very good things, and if we would be able to have those in, in, in a typical Java program, that would be immense. Unfortunately, obviously, we cannot have all that in the Java program because first the platform wasn't designed this way, but we can look at several tools or approaches or advices about how you can build and structure your Java applications to kind of maybe get a little bit closer to the tooling and the excellence that Eve offers you. When I say excellence, it just, it, I mean, it seems great. I'm not really sure how to write a large program in Eve. It does not have lexical scoping, so you just have individual blocks of code that have local state and then there is a global default database. I'm not sure that it's a very common, pleasant way to write large programs, but tooling seems really nice. So let's talk about Java now. We still have time left. So first of all, when you talk about the database, uh, we have the relational databases or ACID databases, and it's kind of cool, but we also what we have, we have local state that sits in, in the JVM heap and it would be very cool if we could use that heap and pretend that it's a database, if we would have atomic access to that, uh, to that memory. Of course, when you talk about atomic access to that memory, the software transactional memory comes to mind. The software transactional memory is a paradigm of how to uh, organize concurrent computations, typically, and there are several examples of an implementation of uh, STM uh, on Java, so typically, uh, a good use case for the STM will be if a memory, a chunk of memory that you want to um, modify, if it has frequent reads but very infrequent writes without any collisions, then you can think of a software transactional memory and you will probably see the benefit in performance or not. So the, the most trivial example of the software transactional memory would be a, a CAS operation. When you compare and swap data in a single, in a single reference, 
Uh, and you can do that either using the Java Util concurrent package, uh, the Atomics, or you can bring the library. If we look at the ACA STM, uh, it offers you a number of classes. It doesn't transform the whole heap of Java program into the soft transactional heap, but it, it can isolate some objects and say that now those objects will hold data that is uh, access to which is transactional. So the smallest example is an atomic ref, which can hold an object, and you can atomically set the values for that or swap it with a different one. And you do that using the inner class uh, atomic, or you can specify a lambda. With a single, with a single value, it, you cannot do much. But if you have a map which supports an atomic axis, then you can do many things. As you know, if you have a map and you, have, you can have a nested structure, you can represent almost anything. Uh, at least JavaScript uh, manages to represent anything with just maps. And if you execute a code like that, and you execute this atomical operation, the soft transaction memory package will, will make sure that anyone who observes the map outside of this and reads that will either see all three operations written uh, all together or none of them will, 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 will succeed. So you get the atomicity, and that is a fairly cool concept. So next time you want to write concurrent code, you might uh, consider that or just go with an actor model. The hot reloading of the code, uh, Java comes with hot swap. Uh, there are also different tools available for reloading code on the fly. One of them called general is by zero turnaround. So which is exactly what it does. You change your Java program, it uh, reflects those changes in the running JVM process. So if you want to know more about that, come to the booth. Uh, we can talk to you later. I won't spend time here. The thing that I talk a little bit about you probably, if you build a large system, you would like to implement the command query uh, responsibility se separation. So you want to separate models for your, the reads of your data and the writes of the data. And you would typically do that with an event handler that reacts to the writes for the reads. If you think about CQRS, you should definitely look at Kafka and the Kafka streams, which is the API for processing those events. Definitely there are great talks or blog posts or documentation about how to do that. If you are ready to change the, infra the infrastructure and the architecture of your system, take a look at that. If you're not ready to change the infrastructure of your system, because that's a very significant change that takes money and uh, time, at least consider doing a very simple thing. You, read, you, mo you manipulate data in two different ways. You read the data, and that could be complex queries, and you write the data. And that is typically quite a simple operation. So if re-architecting the system is hard, consider just using different approaches for how you read and write data. If you use JPA or Hibernate, it is excellent at saving data, right? You just have your data, your object model, and you just say save, and it becomes a database. But querying, especially complex querying, is kind of hard to implement in Hibernate. So what you can do, you can either specify those complex queries in SQL directly. You don't need to use a library for everything that this offers to. And you can use either plain SQL or maybe a library like Juke, which offers you a type safe DSL for uh, specifying SQL queries. Maybe your code will be easier. Now, the declarative approach for writing code uh, kind of gets more and more pop popular, so you can take a look at the reactive streams and the extensions for that. What it means that you will be able to specify pieces of code that will subscribe to each other and subscribe to data coming from the other chunks of code, just like with the reactive blocks of code uh, in Eve, and you can have the API supporting that, the operations to manipulate the data. Uh, you have normal software that will have and use uh, taking that approach. So uh, Spring 5 comes with a functional web framework that features reactive, a reactive paradigm and where you can write your normal web application code in fully reactive way. There are many implementations. If you're having a client side, then there is a library, JavaScript library called MobX, which uh, reacts to the changes in the state and, uh, and it derives anything that can be derived automatically from the state. If you use React, 
then React reacts to the state changes and modifies the DOM, the HTML of your pages. And MobX can populate and react these changes in the data. And together, they can work pretty neatly. If you use IntelliJ IDEA, and personally, I think it's a great ID, so, but whatever you use, IntelliJ IDEA comes with a, a thing called Stream Debugger, which is a tool that offers you visibility into what ha what's happening in your code. If you use the Stream API in your Java code, it's kind of hard to debug that typically because, well, you never know. And it's, when the data flows in a big volume, it's hard to traverse what every element transforms into and if they pass filters or at which state they disappear. So the stream debugger in IntelliJ IDEA, after you execute stuff in a debug mode, it can show you a visualization of what has happened in, during that stream processing uh, phase. So the current data of the stream is evaluated, and you can see that the initial values were those, and then the operation was applied, and you can see into which values they were transformed, and you can follow that, and it's a much easier way to debug uh, stream processing, because here you have the whole picture at a single glance, and this is quite, quite easy. You can also specify individual steps or individual data, and you can see the results of, of, of those in a split mode. So. That's a thing that I, it, they released that very recently, a couple of months ago, maybe half a year. Time flies, and I've, I know that not that many developers yet know about that, but mostly people uh, converted to using Java 8, and obviously we all started using streams where we should and where we shouldn't. And this is a nice tool that can help us figure out why it's actually happening. Another thing that gives you visibility into into what's happening in, the, in, in your program could be an advanced debugger. So Cronon is a tri tra tri sorry, time traveling debugger. What it does, you execute the program and it saves what has happened throughout the program, what values were written and uh, read from the heap, and what were the variables at every given moment of time. And then it can, uh, allows you to replay that. If you are curious about how it does that without actually Sacrificing all the performance, what it does, it doesn't transform the whole Java application, but it allows you to specify several classes which you want to instrument. And then when it records data about that cla those classes, it gives you abilities to travel through time through that and see how the values changed, which is a very, very good ability to have, especially when you're trying to chase a hard to reproduce bug. And on top of that, inside the code when you are reproducing the session, what it can do, it, can, it allows you to add logging statements to, for the variables. So not only you get this binary execution profile, but you also get like a text, if you want to do that, uh, of what has happened to your variables. And then you are better understanding what was in your system, and then it's easier to debug. If you think about performance and the visibility into performance, uh, the state of the art uh, approach, I think, to performance monitoring and re understanding what has to happen with performance would be the Java Mission Control uh, together with the Flight Recorder. So what it is, Java Mission Control is a, uh, it's a, a thing to monitor the state of the JVMs. Uh, I think it works for Oracle JVMs. I'm not sure if it actually works for other. Uh, and the Flight Recorder is an on-demand a turn on feature that can include the data about the execution profile, about the garbage collection, statistics about the optimizations in the JIT, a heap about the latency of certain events, uh, which logs you use, which IO do you use. So it records a number of things using low level probes, so it's fairly efficient. You can use that in production. I think in production it requires a license. In development, it should be free to use. So the biggest benefit of that, it doesn't, you don't have to write all the data, data to a disk, so it doesn't have to come with a large overhead, but you can just spin that data in memory and do not write any data until an incident happens. When you feel that performance gets low or you get any monitoring alerts, you can flush that buffer into a file and then you can restore that and analyze that data offline uh, as you would do with a normal profiler. So. You would see the, the view where you have the hottest methods or you, 
where how much memory anything took and what was happening with your garbage collection. So it's a fairly uh, interesting tool to use in production or just to analyze what happens inside your apps. Uh, if you're interested, another tool by Zero Turnaround called Extrable, and what it does, it visualizes the performance of your application while you develop that. It injects a view into your into your code, and then it shows you a full call stack of what has happened in the background, and shows you the bottlenecks and everything, so you can care about performance while you're developing your application. About that, you can learn more as well at the booth. All in all, there are a number of tools, and what I wanted to say with this session, uh, besides trying to introduce you to uh, EVE as a platform and tell you that such a thing exists and maybe make you jealous about uh, how amazing the future software developers will have it, I wanted you to uh, look at the current state of Java software development and think about that there could be tools, when you, when you find the problem that you don't know how to solve easily, think about that maybe there are tools or maybe there are different approaches that could help you. And, and I hope this was an insightful session and you learned uh, maybe at least something about the tools or something about Eve. With all that, we have three minutes for the questions. I'm not sure if the timer is still going, but we have three minutes for the questions. And if anything, you can always find me online, and I will be happy to chat with you. Thank you.